What do you love about Marvel movies? I love the fact that everybody loves them. <laughs> I, I, there's something that is absolutely to be cherished, I think, when we have something that people like. It, 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 we need more of that. And I think Marvel movies and DCEU movies are really those things that um, get people excited. I mean, I, I don't get as excited for Marvel movies as a lot of people do, but, but I understand their value. And I think that there's a tremendous value. I mean, when Scorsese says the things he says, and I know people say, hey, it's not cinema and this and that. Uh, there's so many things that are cinema. There's two, there's, we can't define cinema as one thing, right? It's only this. It's only a small art house film. Um, no, it's, it's not. It can, it can be a Marvel film. It, as long as um, it, again, I still, I still want to see a very singular directorial artistic vision on the film. And I think that's where the Marvel films sometimes lose their value is when I watch, when you have Chloe... Zhao coming in and doing Eternals. And when you watch Eternals and having obviously recently seen Nomad Land and then The Writer, I mean The Writer, uh, one of my favorite films of the past decade. Uh, when you look at what she, her talent and what she does, and then when you watch Eternals, you don't see this same. You can see that someone came in and said, listen, we love what you're doing, but we're gonna we're, we need to put this in the Marvel world, so we can't let you go full Chloe. We can't let you go full, uh, you know, whoever, even Raimi recently. I think when you watch Multiverse of Madness, you see some parts that are Sam Raimi, but then you see other parts that aren't. You see other parts that almost feel like it's from someone else, and I think that's the challenge. And those are the things that for me are the the hardest thing for a Marvel movie is I wish that Marvel would allow their directors to really impart their vision, their individual singular vision on a film. And, and Eternals is, is the perfect example of that. It just, you don't see Chloe like you do in Nomadland, the writer. You don't see that organic filmmaker. Um, you just, you see it so sparingly in the film that you wonder where she disappears to, right, in the process of the filmmaking. And I think that's the challenge as a filmmaker when you step into certainly an MCU film. I think Warner Brothers does a much better job of allowing their directors a carte blanche in what they're going to do. You look at Joker and what Todd Phillips did with that film. Would Marvel ever allow that? No, there's no chance. Marvel would never. Kevin Feige would never let them make a film like Joker. If Joker were in the Marvel Universe and Todd Phillips said, hey, I want to make this super dark, king of comedy meets taxi driver version of Joker, Kevin Feige would say, no, no way in hell. Warner Brothers said, yes. I think Marvel would be better served if it allowed its directors to do what Todd Phillips did with Joker, to go all out and let that director really go after it. Um, and I think that's the challenge. I think as a filmmaker, when you go work for, for Marvel, you know that you're going to be lost. Uh, you, you, at least you better be aware of it now from watching Eternals, go back, Mar uh, multiple, uh, Doctor Strange 2. When you're a filmmaker and you go in and you, you look at, at uh, what Marvel does with their films, you don't see the director as often. And I think that that is, I think going forward, if I was a director, who really wanted to have my vision of a film up on the screen, I don't think I would work for Marvel because I think they're going to dampen your impact immeasurably. So you see the executive's note when you watch no question. a Marvel film? Oh, yeah. When, when you, you, you see... Uh, I, listen, Marvel is a... Is a Listen, they're the five billion pound gorilla when it comes to, to cinema these days. And Kevin Feige obviously has a very specific plan that is working for them largely. But as we get here into phase four, you're seeing some films like Eternals, even Strange. Let's hope that Thor Love and Thunder is, is stronger. I think that it's interesting as I say all that, I feel like Taika Waititi is given more artistic freedom with his visions of those Thor films than a lot of the filmmakers, but he's earned that too. You got to remember, obviously, this is now going to be his third or is it second? Third or third? It's gonna be, he's he's been in the system, so I think he's earned more trust. But um, but I think that that when you look at 
these Marvel films, I think you absolutely see the studio notes and versus the true full wattage director artistic vision that you see in a lot of these directors' other films. Is there a comic book character that was either made better or made worse in the film version? So either way, did the, the, the comic book version was, was one thing yep. and then the film became the other It comes thing. down to two performances for me. The two performances, um, it's really about the actor and the role. The, there's, there's a lot that have been nailed. I think that's true, but I think there's two without question. Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man and Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. Those are two performances as those comic book characters that frankly can never be recast. I don't, I don't think there's a way that you could ever have someone else play either Iron Man or Wolverine and get away with it because they have cemented their legacy as just iconic. What they've done with those characters, uh, I would never want to try to step into those shoes because it's, it's virtually impossible. And I think those two in particular are the absolute best of the best. Um, that said, you know, you go back and look at even, look at Joker. I mean, you look at all the different ver you go Heath Ledger, um, Heath Ledger Joker. You go obviously Joaquin Phoenix Joker. Um, you, you're looking at two great Jokers. Uh, so there's you can I think it depends on the character, um, but at this point again with with let's say both Wolverine and Iron Man. Um, we've seen so much of Robert Downey Jr. a decade plus going back to you know truly Marvel's first film in Iron Man um, that it's just a legacy that uh, will never go no one will ever touch that I mean he is uh, I think look at look at it this way Robert Downey Jr.'s performance as Iron Man elevated Iron Man from a mid Marvel character right let's just say mid to truly the Mount Rushmore of Marvel characters, I mean, you, you, or comic book heroes in general, comic book characters. You're talking about Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and Iron Man. Those are my four, Wonder Woman, five, okay? Five on the thing, right? And and obviously Gal's done a tremendous job, even though Wonder Woman 84, oh, what a horrible film. Uh, but she's great, the casting's right. Um, but but I think that the, the way that Robert Downey Jr. elevated Iron Man to this character that really, again, was a mid-Marvel character, that's Robert Downey Jr. It's all him. If you put someone else in that film, do we even have the MCU like we, we did? I don't know the answer to that. If someone else plays Iron Man less iconically than Robert Downey Jr. did from the original all the way through, I don't think it's the same legacy. I don't, I don't see how it's possible. He's so He was born to be Iron Man. Even though I think he's great at everything he does and he really needs to be working in independent film. If I was Robert Downey Jr.'s agent, I'd be like, listen, man, you need to be working with A24, you need to be working with Neon, make some small t independent film. He's a tremendous actor. I think people forget that about Robert Downey Jr. Um, tremendously smart guy, too, if you listen to interviews from him. God, brilliant man. Um, but but the, I think people lose the fact that that he is i think he's he might be the singular reason why marvel is the way is what it is robert downey jr so he took sort of a mid-tier comic book character yep. and made it oh, yeah. top shelf no question i mean again iron man was just, no one back in even let's go back to the mid 2000s uh, before iron man and you say name uh, comic book characters people would not throw out iron man no way they would throw out hulk obviously spider-man batman the, the traditional superman no one would say Iron Man. Now they would. Now, now you would. And I think that's going to be the challenge going forward too, because now that he's gone, and I, I, by the way, do not bring that character back. Okay, you, I, as as tempting as it is, as much trouble as you get into, let's just assume that the MCU starts to really go on a downslide. Do not ever bring him back. I don't care if it not in the multiverse, nothing. That's a perfect ending to a to a character, and in you're going to tarnish the legacy. And I think that will be a challenge because ultimately. If, if you struggle, you're like, well, how can we get everyone back? Well, let's bring back Robert Downey Jr. Um, I'm sure he'd do it for the right amount of money. <laughs> he made so much cash playing that character. But I think artistically, it's the wrong choice. And for legacy, it's the wrong choice. So I hope it doesn't happen. Why do you think comic book movies dominate the box office? <sighs> That's good. Um, I think ultimately films are about accessibility certainly for audience, and the larger that your 
pie chart is for the given film, Marvel obviously dominates like almost the entire pie of, of available moviegoers, right? So you're looking at a four quad film, which means young, old, male, female, everybody's in, right? Families especially. So that's the reason Marvel is so successful is obviously it's four quad. Obviously, you're talking about a film that appeals to families, superheroes, escapism. It's got all these things going for it that it's very easy to understand why it's successful. That said, uh, after watching Multiverse of Madness and going back to Eternals, you're, you're looking at Marvel being in a spot where they really need Thor Love and Thunder to be not good. They need it to be borderline great or better because you're at a spot where I think people are starting to go. I mean, you've, you've seen the, the chatter on social media. People are saying, I'm kind of over comic book movies. I'm not as excited now as I was. And I think that's the challenge is how do we recreate, how do we get that going again? And um, for me, again, the answer is very simple is allow these directors to make the film they want to make without the overriding studio notes slash MCU, Kevin Feige saying, this is what we're doing. Trust in your filmmaker to deliver something that will re-energize the fan base. And when you look at Joker and Todd Phillips, granted, it's completely apart from the DCEU, but either way, it's still connected. And look what that film did, a billion worldwide, a film that people were like, what are we doing with an R-rated CBM? And it turns out to be obviously an Oscars player, Oscars winner, and and a film that really re-energized, I think, DC, even if it's disconnected. But why? Because they allowed the director to make the film that he wanted to make. And most studios wouldn't do that. Warner Brothers get so much crap for you know what happened with Zack Snyder. And I understand things happen. Nothing's perfect in the studio world. But you have to give Warner Brothers the credit they are due for taking chances. And we need more studios to take chances. We lost Fox, as you guys know. You know, 20th Century is now part of Disney. Fox was kind of doing their own thing, Deadpool. And, and now that that's gone, you're, you lost an entire studio that used to take chances. Like Fox did a great job of doing that. Um, and now that's under the Disney umbrella, we'll see what happens. I know they're going to make a Deadpool 3. Will it be in the same irreverent, super R, hard R, uh, CBM that we've expected? I think the answer is yes, because you can't do that any other way. But studios taking chances, we need more of that. And Warner Brothers does that. Four quad, you said it's young, old. So four quad, so yeah, four quad film is, is, is a film that appeals basically to everybody, right? So when you talk about a four quad film, you're talking about something that when you look at the movie going pie, available audience of this pie chart, you're talking about pretty much the entire pie chart filled in with one giant slice of the movie going public that will go see your film, and you're talking about young, old, uh, male, female, it's everybody, right? So, so that's those are Marvel films. That's Jurassic World Dominion. That's um, you know, it's not every film certainly, but the films, those are the films that are going to do the best at the box office. Maverick, Top Gun Maverick is a four quad film, even though it probably is a little bit lesser on the younger. But you know the screening I went to, to show you how four quad this is, I sit down last Thursday when the film opens, here I am at Top Gun Maverick, I sit down on my seat, four o'clock screening on a Thursday. On my right is a woman uh, that's probably in her mid 80s. And on my left, a family <laughs> with two young kids under the age of five. So you've got five to 85, right? And someone in the middle right there. <laughs> and it's just like, this is, this is the whole pie. This is the four quad. And you see it in action. And uh, not every film is going to be that way. But but Marvel is. And uh, and most summer films are going to be four quad because they know the kids are out of school. Pixar? So, yeah, Pixar. Certainly. Lightyear. Uh, the, Pixar would be a four quad film. Um, you know, any, any of those. Usually, tr traditionally, you're going to see those at, at Christmas. You're going to see them at over the summer when you know you have those kids available to you all day for the matinees and all that stuff. But, but yeah, those are the films that are going to do the best.